Okay, we'll go ahead and get started um, just uh, for sake of time because today's topic is a little um, uh, a little more detailed. So um, I wanna say hello, my name's Carol Wyatt Evans and I'm the Chemicals and the Environment Agent here at the UF IFAS Extension in Sarasota. I'm joined today by my coworker, Sarah Bostic, who is our Sustainable Ag Agent. Um, our colleague, Mindy, who is also involved in the series is currently on leave. Um, but we hope to have her back here soon. Um, Sarah is doing double time working as a sustainable ag agent, um, both in Sarasota and DeSoto County. So I want to give her a shout out <clears throat> for spearheading this program with the tiny wedge of free time that she had available. I also wanted to mention our communications guru, Kevin, um, who does an amazing job of um, getting these videos loaded to our website. We've also added recently a weekly blog associated with this series. So please go to our website and check out our first blog. And um, hopefully every week we will have uh, a question from this series as that next week's blog. So I wanna say thank you all for joining our edible gardening series. It's offered every Monday from noon to about 1230-ish. Um, sometimes we go to about one. Um, this week's topic is sustainable pest control. I'll spend a little over 10 minutes discussing this topic, um, then we'll open it up for questions. The topic is a big concept. Um, so it's going to take a little more time than normal to present. And so depending on how many people we have joining us, um, we may have to stick with you using the chat box for your question. Um, Sarah will be monitoring the chat box um, throughout this presentation. So at any time, you can go ahead and type your, your any question that you have into the presentation. So again, um, your question does not have to be specific to this presentation. You can ask any question about gardening. So any questions we don't get to today, if we run out of time or we need further discussion on, we'll provide you a follow-up email. So let's go ahead and get going. So sustainable pest control, gardening the old fashioned way. So we've heard from many people that they were really good at gardening before they moved to Florida and now they feel like they've lost it. Um, we've also heard from people who've lived here their whole lives and they've recently just started gardening and realizing that there's a lot of challenges that come with it. So this series grew out of that need for more information about Florida gardening and being extension, <laughs> we're excited to be able to offer that support to our community. So today we'll be discussing one of the many challenges of gardening and that's pest insects. So in contrast to Sarah, who has to tailor her information about gardening to the region, I'm lucky enough to be, off, be able to offer information on a subject that can be implemented anywhere and that's integrated pest management. So when gardening, we sometimes feels like, feel like bugs and weeds have teamed up against us to make our lives miserable. Um, well, that's actually true to, to an extent, um, but many weeds, because many weeds um, actually support insect populations. So in the big picture though, insects are really looking to find um, a location that meets three basic needs, and that's food, water, and shelter. And by having a garden, you have created the perfect environment for these pests. So today we'll briefly talk about um, ways to manage your garden in order to minimize those damaging effects from those pests. So the best and most sustainable way to garden or really any situation where pests can be an issue is the use of integrated pest management or IPM. IPM is grounded in making decisions based on the insect and the biology of the plant and the insect as well as the ecology, sorry. Um, IPM is a more sustainable approach to managing pests by using a combination of practices or strategies to control the pests using the least invasive measures possible. <clears throat> First and foremost, IPM is a program which manages the system holistically, and it should not be thought of as just a pest control tool. Um, there are five basic components to IPM. So that's the five listed. So identification, monitoring, scouting, decision-making, intervention, and evaluation. IPM addresses each of these components individually, but they are not independent of each other. And in order to have a successful IPM plan, you really need to make sure you're using all of the components. And the emphasis of IPM is always to stress prevention. It is much more complicated and less successful when you're using it as a when you try to use it as a curative measure. Um, so being proactive in tending your garden will save you a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of frustration. So the first component in IPM is proper insect identification. 
So pest identification um, is the first step in insect control in any situation where you think you may need to implement some sort of a control measure. Um, the reason for insect identification is that if you don't know what it is, how do you know you actually need to control it? You need to determine, is it a pest insect or is it a beneficial insect? Um, what life stage is it in? Knowing the life stage is very important um, from both the perspective of how to control it or if it needs to be controlled. If you look at this picture, some people might panic and try to go ahead and control these insects, but they would have flunked the first step in IPM. So that black alien looking creature is actually a beneficial insect, right? It's the larval stage of a lady beetle, um, which is a voracious feeder on aphids, which are the pest insect in, in the picture. So if control measures were taken um, to try to control these insects, then more harm would have been done than good um, in order to, to try and to control them. So invest in a good reference book on good bugs and bad bugs of your region, right? So make sure where you're located is where that, that book pertains to. You know, don't, if you're not in California, don't get a book about California. Um, it can be incredibly useful in helping you to identify the insects um, as well as their life stages. So next is knowing the, um, knowing the pests means understanding the body morphology. So how does it feed, right? Does it have a chewing mouth part or a piercing sucking mouth part or even a piercing sucking raspy mouth part? Um, you can tell this by the damage. Even if you don't see the insect, you can tell by the damage. So chewing mouth parts are easy. Um, these are gonna be things like beetles and weevils and caterpillar, right? You see chewing damage. Um, damage from window painting. Um, window painting is when you get that, that, that silhouette looking, um, and this means you have young caterpillars, and they're most likely army worms when they're in your garden. And this is the best time to take action when those are really small and you're just starting to see that window painting. Stippling is going to be caused by something like a piercing sucking insect, like an aphid or mealybug or a white fly or even spider mites. Bronzine is unique. Um, bronzing is caused by thrips and only thrips. And that's when you get that, that um, the top looks bronze, right? It gets uh, like a, it almost sparkles with bronze and then it starts to, to dry up and it'll break out. Another thing is um, like, how many legs does it have? If you're looking at a caterpillar, um, all caterpillars have three sets of true legs because they're an insect, um, but the number of pro legs vary between species. So pro legs are those, um, those additional legs at the back of the caterpillar that actually help it to hold on to the branch. Um, butterfly caterpillars generally have about five pairs of pro legs. Um, Sawfly larvae have usually about seven pair of pro legs. And then some loopers um, have like two, three or four pair of pro legs. So to circle back around to the life stage, it's important to be able to identify those immature stages of insects in both your beneficial and your pest insect. One big reason is you don't want to apply a control measure, right, specifically pesticides, um, that will be harmful to these beneficials. Um, because if you accidentally kill the immatures um, of those beneficials, then you just lost a really important control strategy. And one that was free of charge, right? It was doing the job on its own. Also, the immature stage of beneficials tend to eat more pest insects than the adult stage. Um, so keep that in mind. So knowing those immature stages are really important. And finally, once you've determined that it is a pest insect, then it is much easier to control um, these insects when they're small, right? So think preventative, right? Preventative and then fast action. So monitoring. Monitoring is extremely helpful in the garden. Remember, proactive is the key to successful gardening. So a few, few tools that will be um, really helpful are things like a hand lens, different types of traps like your sticky traps um, or sticky cards, uh, pitfall traps, pheromone traps, and then even things like soapy water bowls or um, beer bowls. Invest in a decent hand lens. I, I'll tell you, I promise it's going to be the best $10 you've ever spent. A hand lens lets you see things that you would otherwise miss if you were just scanning the plants. I actually bought um, one of those that looks like a mini welder's helmet, um, but it has magnifying uh, lenses at the end of it. So the flip down has a little magnifier on it. So this for me is really helpful because it frees up my hands in order to manipulate the plant. Um, passive monitoring devices are those things like those, the yellow sticky cards. Um, these are especially useful when you're trying to um, trap uh, small flying insects and things like whitefly. Blue sticky cards are also helpful, but those are specific to 
thrips. So remember that there are some things that are, are species specific. Um, another one of those are pheromone traps. So this right here is a pheromone trap. It it's, looks like a, it is a sticky card, but this little lure, it's called a pheromone lure in the middle, um, that is that will is the pheromones, the, the um, reproductive pheromones that it puts out and draws those insects in. But again, that is specific to that insect. Pitfall traps like this um, help with uh, ground dwelling insects such as beetles. And then your soapy water bowls or beer, beer bowls, those help with additional ground dwelling, like especially arthropods, um, such as like slugs and snails. <clears throat> there are specific plants that are prone to insect attacks, um, which are called key plants. And these are ones that you really need to pay close attention to because if, when, they, when they start to draw on those insects, those are the ones you need to start treating. And then a key pest is one that can be problematic and can cause serious damage. Um, uh, for example, like whitefly. Um, whitefly vector many diseases such as like tomato yellow leaf curl virus, as well as like tomato mosaic virus. I always have a hard time with that. Um, once a key pest has been identified, then um, control measures really need to be taken to minimize any potential damage, especially with those ones that, um, that vector those diseases. And then monitoring your arthropod community composition. Um, this means is what is there? Um, what beneficials do you have? What life stage is present? What are the ground dwelling insects that you have? Because there's a lot of really good ground, uh, beetles that are, are really supportive uh, in biocontrol. Um, and what about spiders? Um, spiders are one of the best insect predators of all time because their entire diet is insects, it's all they eat. And then the final thing is record keeping. Record keeping is essential to continue your success. Keep note of what shows up, when it shows up, what plants it shows up on, and then continue to track that as well as your, um, your control measures um, that you're applying. So when you use that for your season, then this is gonna help you with the following seasons to know what to expect so that you can even be more successful than you are that season. Or if something completely didn't work, you'll know that that didn't work. <laughs> so record keeping is vital. And then decision making, okay. This is by far like the toughest thing to determine. When do you actually intervene and what do you do to help the, to control the pests? Um, there are thresholds uh, for crop insects, which are helpful, but you really need to do what works for you in your garden. Um, whatever you decide, remember that timing is critical and it's always easier to control a pe pest outbreak when that insect is small. So intervention. Intervention actually um, gets broken down even further. Um, there are four basic control measures that help support your decision making, and some of these should actually be implemented well before you even start planting. Remember, this is all part of integrated pest management, and the components are intertwined with each other. Um, these control strategies are con con cultural control, mechanical control, biological, and chemical control. Keep in mind, um, not just that you're trying to get rid of the pest, but you need to try and understand what is happening to the plants in that surrounding environment that is attracting those pests to it. Um, usually it's a mix of many factors, some of which we can control, things like fertilizing and watering, right? But things we can't control, like temperature and humidity. Um, so let's look at a few of those components. So cultural control. This is something that you do before you even start planting. You need to make sure your location is right for the plant. Does it get enough sun or not enough sun? Is it, um, how's your air circulation? What's your soil selection? Um, are you planting in raised beds or are you doing in-ground planting? Taking the time to think through that garden before you even start planting will help address these potential challenges in advance and lead to a more successful garden in the long term. Um, plant selection is vital as well. Um, Sarah has stressed this at our previous sessions. Um, plant what works for that region and try, if you can, to get resistant varieties of plants. Um, this helps to uh, keep those, those pest insects away and at least uh, helps in minimizing the damage that they can, they can do to your garden. So irrigation. Um, are you going to install drip irrigation or how do you plan to water? Overhead watering brings on a whole bunch of additional challenges in pest control, especially when you think about things like um, fungal and disease growth, right? So we kind of don't want to want to go the route of overhead watering. Fertilization, okay, too much love is not good. Um, too much, um, too much 
fertilization or fertilizer actually stresses the plant. And that then in turn draws more pests, uh, insects to it. And then mulching, know what you're going to use as ground cover to help support that, that plant health, which also decreases the, the pests, right? So you're creating a barrier between your plant and, and that, uh, that ground. And then think of things like companion plants or trap, trap plants or banker plants. These are really good in helping support, especially your beneficial insect populations. Now mechanical controls. Um, these are the physical controls that you, you can use for pest control. So things like pruning and trimming. You wanna prune off dead, disease or infested plant material. Um, and this helps to decrease that, any of that spread that might happen with, with, with that organism. Hand removing of insects and weeds. Pull those weeds. <laughs> um, and you can, you can hand pick, especially caterpillars, off of your, off of your plants. So um, many weeds are host plants for uh, pest insects. So keep your garden as well as the surrounding areas as weed free as you can. Um, plant removal. Okay, if you have a disease or an infested plant, especially if it's something that can spread to other plants and be harmful, just remove the plant. Keeping it in the ground, waiting for that last bunch of tomatoes to mature um, is really not worth the risk um, to spread that disease to your garden, maybe you're in a community garden, or worse off is even to maybe our commercial growers. So, um, you know, just, just call it a day and get rid of that plant. Debris removal, this is really important too. First, any diseased infested material should be removed immediately, right? And take it away from the garden and do not compost it. It needs to go in the garbage. Um, if you leave that stuff on the ground, then um, that just those organisms and those, whether it's a, a fungus or a disease that's on it, gives it that opportunity to, to just continue to spread through your garden. So biocontrols. So this is, <laughs> I'm the insect person, so it's by far one of my favorite uh, control strategies, and that's biocontrol. <clears throat> I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we actually have an upcoming uh, series uh, on, on biocontrol itself. So biocontrol is actually using existing natural enemies of the pest insects that are already in the area to help you with, with what's natural pest control. You can also purchase many of these beneficial insects, but it's really best to try and conserve the ones that are already present in the garden, right? Because they're already established. But definitely take control of bio, take advantage of biocontrol. Um, it's good for your garden and it's definitely good for the ecosystem. Um, there are many different types of uh, biocontrols for the garden, but the three main, you know, three main categories that they fall under are things like predators or predators or generalists, and those are things that basically eat anything that come across its path, and that's something like a spider as well. Um, parasitoids, okay, this is mainly wasps and flies, um, and they're usually host specific, right? They only go to one thing or maybe two things, um, and they're freaky, but they're so cool, um, but they're a really good source of, of biocontrol. And then there are things like naturally occurring pathogens. And these are things are like our antipathic uh, fungi, bacteria and viruses, as well as nematodes. Nematodes do fall under that, uh, the pathogens. Again, we're gonna, we'll address these in detail in a couple of weeks. So chemicals. So this is the last chemical control and um, kind of my last slide. Um, the last control measure is chemical control. And for now, we're only gonna, gonna address biorational pesticides. Biorational pesticides are the primary focal point of chemical control in an IPM system. Conventional chemicals also play a role, but their use should be extremely limited. And when you're talking about your garden, I would say they should not be there. Um, these biorationals should, be, be, should do the job. So biorational pesticides are a broad range of low environmental impact products that are typically derived from natural products. So these products are things like your botanicals. So these are things such as like neem and delimaline and your pyrethrums. And then you have your horticultural soaps and your, uh, your sorry, your insecticidal soaps and your horticultural oils. Then you have minerals. And these are things such as like diatomaceous earth and sulfur and then microbials. And again, these are your fungi, your bacteria, and two of the big ones in, in, um, <clears throat> in, in the bioration pesticides are Bt, so Bacillus thuringiensis, thuringiensis, and spinosin. And then you also have viruses and the nematodes. So 
these products are a great choice for chemical control if you have to get to that point of using it um, because they um, have fast breakdown, they degrade rapidly, they're fast acting, um, they have a really reduced risk to non-target organisms. So it's, it's kind of what you're spraying is what's gonna be controlled. Um, they have little to no impact on beneficials and natural enemies. And then the greatest thing is they have low to no toxicity to us, to wildlife, as well as to the environment. So many of these products kill on contact, while some of them may need to be ingested, but almost all of them require precise timing and to the correct stage of the insect. So there is a slight learning curve sort of um, when you're using these, but if you've invested in gardening, um, learning the proper way to use these chemicals is part of that investment. So, you know, think of it that way. So remember, these are also mainly biologicals, which means that they do have a limited shelf life, right? They're alive, they're, they're, they're organic, they're biologicals. Some will die and, and therefore be ineffective if, you're, if they're kept in a hot place like a garage for an extended period of time. Um, they usually target a specific life stage. Um, for example, if it needs to be in, in, ingested like BT, um, you need to be sure to target the feeding stage of that insect. So if you're trying to spray for caterpillars and it's a late stage caterpillar, and then you spray that, more than likely that caterpillar is actually getting ready to pupate. So it's no longer feeding. So you're gonna be wasting your money, you're gonna be applying um, chemicals unnecessarily, and you're gonna be really frustrated because this is not gonna work and it's not gonna do what you expected. Um, convention, uh, birational chemicals are also, they tend to be a little bit more expensive than, than conventional chemicals, but they are definitely worth that investment because of the things that they offer. And then remember that um, chemical applications are part of an IPM system, but they should only be used after all those other control measures that we talked about or the control strategies have already been applied um, with limited success. And then you turn to these, to the chemicals if you need to. So with that, these are some really helpful uh, publications, the EDIS publications. Um, so we, we can send this out, but these are on um, the, these natural products that I talk about as, as well as how to grow a garden, how to grow a garden organically, and the beneficial pests that are beneficial insects that are in the garden. With that, we will end the slide. Appreciate you letting me uh, talk at you for <laughs> for more than 10 minutes. Thank you so much.